Good morning. Welcome to our service here at Grace United Methodist Church. We are gathering in Gaithersburg, Maryland. To all of you gathered inside, I hope you're warming up here. Find a warm spot here in the sanctuary, and thank you for uh, coming out on this cool uh, January morning. And for all who are joining us online, we're so honored to have this opportunity to worship with you. We give thanks for the technology. It may be the cold is affecting it a little bit, so if you are having sound issues on Zoom, if you are able to jump over to the Facebook, you'll be able to do that, and the service will be posted later to YouTube as another option, but praying that it all will work out. We are grateful that we can gather as a church community where we find strength in gathering, where we are reminded of the abundance of God's love, and that's something that we will be celebrating this morning on this very special weekend as we give thanks for the life and ministry of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are reminded of the work of justice that continues in this world that we as a church are called to be part of. Today we have a white rose on our altar in loving memory of Dr. Kaz Kawata. Kaz passed away this past week and we are just so thankful for his life and his ministry amongst us. When you have an opportunity. His obituary is posted on Duvall's page, but just a lifetime of service and ministry going from the difficulties of an internment camp to being in the army, the Battle of the Bulge, a missionary in India, and his work as a professor at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Kaz, up until recently, would put out a weekly book review of a theology, of writings, of the church being the church today. So Kaz, of course, worked with our Exploring Ministry class for so many years. We have been blessed by his life. And so we pray for his children, grandchildren, and family, and just let us be uplifting them as we give thanks for Kaz Kawata. As we gather this day, may we open our hearts and allow them once again to be centered on the one for whom we gather to worship. I invite you to join me now in our call to worship. I waited patiently for God, who turned to me and heard my cry, who lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. We sing a new song. Our mouths are full of the praise of God. Blessed are we when we make the Lord our trust when we do not turn aside to false gods. We sing of all your many wonders, O God, too many to declare them all. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but our ears you have pierced and a body you have prepared for us. We sing, here I am, I have come, I desire to do your will, O my God, your law is in my heart. Let us pray aloud. Leading and guiding God, you have opened the doors to us for true service. We are encouraged to become involved in ministries of peace and justice. The light of promise is reflected in your spirit, which rests in each one of us. Get us ready to serve you. Guide our lives as we learn more of what you would have us do. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we all join in singing hymn number 344, Lord, you have come to the lake shore.
invite you to be seated, please. And at this time, I'd like to invite all our children who are here at the church to join me up front for this morning's children's message and say a special good morning to all who are joining us online. So glad that you're here. Part of this special circle right here. How's that? Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Cold out there, isn't it? Oh, my. Uh, cold where you're at, I'm sure, there, but glad we can gather in the warmth here. Well, it's a holiday weekend, isn't it? What do you like about holiday weekends? Just sleep in? Yeah. <laughs> no school? Very cool. A lot. Hanging out with family, sure, absolutely. Those are all special times in which we can gather and just uh, we give thanks for. Now, uh, I don't know, I being a holiday, I, my day sort of got off to a rough start this morning, not to tell you my woes, but here I, you know, I, I went out for my morning run. That was vigorous right there. That was cold, but then I made that. And since it was a holiday and I was going to watch a ball game last night, I had bought some microwave popcorn. Now, if you were here Christmas Eve at our 8 o'clock service, I told about our puppy dog named Callie, who is a yellow lab. Uh, it stands for California. She's a California girl, my daughter said. She just, but as a yellow lab, she's supposed to like the water, but she doesn't. But she does love to surf, and that is counter surf, is how I told the story. So I should have known better. I had one bag of the popcorn, thinking the box was safe on the kitchen island, only to come back from my run this morning, and there it was, destroyed. And all these little pieces and all this popcorn everywhere on my living room floor. My did not start out the day in the best of moods, even though it was a, a, a holiday. But then I got to thinking, I'm going to have to clean this up even though it wasn't my fault. I, I didn't make the mess. You can't have a mess like that. But then my little grandson, he's 11 months, and he crawls, and he's coming over this afternoon. So I didn't want him, you know, finding popcorn pieces or a car. Well, that could, that could be dangerous. So uh, I wanted to do that to make sure that it was safe for him. Now, that's a long ways to go, I realize, when we stop and think about what are we celebrating on this holiday? What is this holiday that we are commemorating? That's right. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we remember his work of justice. And the way I remember the word justice is he, to work for the well-being of everyone. And that's something that we must continue to hold before us as the church, that we are working for the well-being even if our, our own lives are well off, if popcorn is my biggest worry in life, I have it pretty good, don't I, in that way? But I know there's a lot of people in this world who are not experiencing well-being. And we can look at our history and we can see where people have been treated badly because of the color of their skin or where they've experienced injustice. And we might be saying, well, that, that happened a long time ago. Yet, if it's not corrected, it creates dangerous space, doesn't it? Where others can still be hurt or looked down upon. Dr. King was famous for saying, if injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere. So it means us getting down on our knees in prayer, praying for a better world, but also in service. Where do we need to be cleaning up? That is, where do we need to be correcting what is wrong? Where can we be helping other people out? That's continuing the work of Dr. King, that this can be a more just world. On our own, it's too much, isn't it? But in Jesus working through us, all things become possible. Now, I bought that popcorn to watch a ball game last night. Sat down and enjoyed it. The ball game, it was 20-something to nothing, and it wasn't even halftime. And I turned to my wife, Betsy, said, I'm not wasting my time watching this. So I turned the channel and went and did something else. 
only to get up this morning and see the score where the other team came back and made a last second score and won the game, I missed out. I had given up on something that could have been a source of joy. Sometimes that happens in our own lives, in our own walk with God. We think, I'll never overcome this problem in my life, or this is never going to make a difference, faith in my life, and we give up too soon when there's so much joy. There's so much of a difference we can make in this world, and each of you and all of us together can make a difference as a church, and I'm so thankful that you are part of our work, and I pray that we'll each take time to celebrate the freedom and opportunity we have to work towards, you say it in the Pledge of Allegiance still, don't you, in school? How does that end? and justice for all. Well-being for all is our hope and prayer. Thank you for coming up. And today I have a a word search that is based on Dr. King and his legacy. So I'm just going to ask Laurel if you would take one here and take one to someone else as well. There we go. Thank you. And just share these with others. And for those of you at home, I pray that this will be a very special day of remembrance and weekend for you. And thank you for being part of our church community. Thank you all for coming up. Uh, Miss Laura, we have uh, Breakfast Club. Let me bring a microphone to you here. And, uh, something hot on the menu today on this cold day. <laughs> well, if I hadn't have burnt it, there would have been something oh. hot on the menu. Oh. So, um, oh. no, we do have uh, breakfast this morning. All school age children, um, all the way up through high school, are welcome to join us in Fellowship Hall for breakfast. Thank you, Laura. I invite you to join me now as we offer together our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Faithful God, you call us to be saints, but we are more comfortable with the role of sinner. You call us to be your servants, but we worry that we lack the skills to do your work. You put a new song of praise in our mouths, but we stumble on unfamiliar words. You show us the work to be tackled, but we turn away defiant. Insisting we have more important things to do, put your song on our lips and in our hearts and remind us of the joy that awaits us when we put our trust in you. Guide us into the light of your unwavering, never-ending, and grace-filled love. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God is faithful and ever-present. The God who knew us before our birth loves us still and strengthens us that we will one day be blameless. Through the gift of Jesus Christ, God offers forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Enter into the light. And now Bob Tyson will lead us in our scripture lesson this morning, a reading from 1 Corinthians. Good morning, church. Our lesson this morning is from Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother's sothness to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. 
just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, choir, so much. That canon of praise, may that become the rule that we live by each and every day. All that we do, bring praise, bring glory to God. Thank you for that powerful word. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Lord, we are so grateful. Grateful for the opportunity that we can gather to offer our praise unto you. 
Truly it is with thanksgiving flowing from our hearts that we are here. That's what brings us out on a cold morning. That's what causes us to intentionally tune in, and that is to celebrate and to offer our praise to you for the gift of life that you give us in Jesus the Christ. That is something we celebrate the moment our eyes open on a new day, a fresh day, a new opportunity to praise you. And Lord, at the end of the day, may it truly bring a peace to our hearts to know we tried to bring glory to you. So in this time, O God, we pray your same Holy Spirit that that awakens us to a new day will use this time to empower us that we may bring even more praise and glory to you in our everyday living. Bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really enjoying this new series that uh, Reverend Derek Weber has written about glimpses of the kingdom, of the kingdom, the community, and where we are given these God sightings. No matter what group I gather with as a church, we did it at the men's breakfast yesterday. We had a wonderful God sighting shared. We have God sightings that are, I'm sure, being shared at the breakfast club gathering as I speak, and in our Bible school, and when we gather in small groups. All those ways that we are given these glimpses of how God is at work in our world today. This abundance of God's love we experience. The Reverend Derek Weber wrote the following in introducing today's time. And I noted I love how the way that the Reverend Derek Weber reflects on this letter that Paul writes from in 1 Corinthians. That the church has everything it needs to be the church. That's an amazing and powerful statement of faith. Too often we spend time wishing we had more people or resources or volunteers or activities. But what if instead we are simply thankful? Thankful for the gifts we have, the people we have, for how they give of themselves and their resources and give thanks for the mission and witness that we are able to do. Thankfulness. And he continues, expressing this thankfulness. Paul can teach us to be grateful for the gifts that God has given to the church, even with its frailties. Gifts of understanding, gifts of caring, gifts of words that help and heal, gifts of faithfulness to Jesus Christ, gifts of shared community. Harry Adams stated it this way, he said, The church is rich in blessings, not because of the accomplishments of the people within the fellowship, but because of the grace of God that has enriched and sustained the people. That's the abundance of God that we celebrate. My heart continues to overflow with the joy we experienced last Sunday evening when we gathered for our chili cook-off. We had wonderful food. There were over 13 different types of chilies. And, so, and, and I was glad it was the youth had the, the job of judging the chilies and not me there because they were all wonderful. And, and the table conversation around youth ministry was powerful. Being with our youth at table and hearing their words, hearing their desire for the church to know fellowship with one another, to be in ministry and worship and in service and echoed through the room, I give thanks for how God's Holy Spirit is at work. There is an abundance that we have as a church because of God's grace. Now, like many of you, yes, I find myself saying the things that Dr. Weber mentioned there hoping that there will be more more people, wondering where uh, folks are that I haven't seen. And I know for many of you, you can't come out yet, that it's not safe for you. But missing and wondering, how can we reach more people? Or I, I meet with our finance team and hear about the serious issues in regards to our finances right now. Yes, we, we have endowments that saints have left the church, but over the years we have used the profits from these investments to sustain our budget in considerable ways. And lately there haven't been profits if you've been, uh, been watching the market there. And so, so I see these concerns here. Or then you hear about the church and how we might divide as a denomination. So, so let me be clear, I am proud and seek to remain a United Methodist. 
I give thanks for who we are as a people of God. I give thanks for how we include and seek to include everyone. There is no second-class citizenship when it comes to being the people of God, and that's something to celebrate. I give thanks that we are a connectional church as a denomination, that when there are horrible issues like the rains and floods in California or the tornadoes in Alabama and other places, we can be of help. I give thanks for Robin Wilburn, her ministry. Robin joins us in Zoom and worship. Robin, blessing upon you and your family. I give thanks for our work in Haiti, Mongolia, and throughout the world. We can do this as a people who are connected, connected in Jesus Christ. This is something that we celebrate. This is something we give thanks for. We find our strength in the abundance of God's love. Here was Paul. He was writing to the church at Corinth, a church he had worked very hard to grow, to, to bring into being. 18 months of his ministry and lifespans back in Paul's day weren't as long as they are, are of ours today. So 18 months is a long time. And so here he is, but then this scribe, uh, Sothenes, whoever he is, they start communicating to him and to Paul that there's division in the church. But what does Paul do? Does he just send this nice flowery letter of greeting? No, hear what he says in that. I, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle means one who is sent. The original Apostles 12, they had actually experienced the very physical presence of Jesus. Paul qualifies because of what he experienced on the Damascus Road. Go to Acts 9 and read about that where, where Jesus reaches out to him. I, Paul, called to be an apostle sent. We as the church are a people who are sent, who are called to be in ministry sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a world who so desperately needs to hear it. This is our calling. Reverend Weber talks about how his son Rees was going on his first overnight trip with the youth group. They were going on a ski trip. And so like any good parents, they were making sure, giving him all sorts of instruction and telling him how to, how to behave, how to conduct himself. After all, it was a church group and sent him on his way. The second day of the trip, young Rees calls his parents and their hearts just sink when they see it's him calling, thinking something's wrong. He, he got hurt or something and terrible. And so they answered the phone. They said, are you okay? Yes, dad, I'm fine. Mom, I'm fine. But I need more money. Many of us have gotten that phone call. <laughs> but then he went on to explain, I need the money so I can take skiing lessons. His parents looked at each other and thought, well, this is less expensive than an emergency room treatment for sure. And so, the, so they sent the money. But do you see what he was asking for this money? So he could learn to do what he was already doing. That's who we are. We are called as a church to be learning what we are already doing. We are each called by God. We are each called to be part of God's work of justice in this world. This is a work that goes beyond our resources. This is a work that goes beyond our capabilities. We are part of something greater than ourselves and being the church and being the community, and being the body of Christ. Dr. King, in his famous last sermon, put it this way. Familiar words, I'm sure, to many of you. He stated, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I am happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 
Those words spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. the night before he was assassinated in Memphis still haunt us. To this day, they generate speculation and debate. Some are convinced that King knew he would be killed. And with the kind of turmoil King was creating and the general upheaval that was being witnessed from the courthouse squares to college campuses, well, it doesn't require much imagination to envision a scenario where King would be gunned down. King noted on that very night that the nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion all around. Others are equally certain that King did not have a premonition about his own death. John Cartwright, who holds the professorship at Boston University, which bears King's name, believes that King was not predicting his own death. Rather, according to Cartwright, Dr. King was only aware that the arc of justice is long and that significant changes only happen over an extended period of time. In other words, King knew that his words might articulate the dream, but the reality of the dream might not be experienced until generations later. May we take time to reflect on Dr. King's teachings. This includes realizing that we are called to live not by our own wisdom, not by your own preferences and prejudices, but by the call of God. The vision of the kingdom that defines our hopes and prayers and service. We are in this together. We are part of something larger than ourselves. That's who we're called to be. That's why we're called to learn what we are already doing. We are blessing not only those in need today, we are addressing the injustices as we encounter them as a church globally and locally, but we are blessing generations to come through your discipleship and mine. That's why the work of being an anti-racist church is so important. That's not casting names or aspersions on anyone. No one's calling anyone racist. What I recognize, my life, I come from a place of privilege. And some people don't like that word, and that's fine. But when I look at my own life, I didn't choose what color I would be, so it's not about white guilt. I didn't choose my lot in life, but what I've known in my life, I've never been hungry. I've seldom been a minority in anything. I have had so much opportunity. And when I recognize that somebody, because of the color of their skin or what they are facing in life, doesn't have the same opportunity, that causes me to see there's still work to be done to make this a more just world. And God is seeking to evolve each and every one of us. The church can do what collectively what we cannot do on our own. God is the one who enriches us. God is the one who sustains us. The church has important work to carry on that is all so relevant. I'm telling Dr. Weber's story about his son, Rees, reminded me of the first time we took our daughter, Rebecca, to church camp. I wanted to so be there for that experience. It turned out that I was... Uh, at a workshop in Dayton, Ohio, and we were living in Newmarket, where we live now. And so to be back for that Sunday afternoon launch meant uh, finishing up Saturday, driving all night, and being here and seeing her off, only to drive that back to Dayton and be there for Monday morning's gatherings. But I did it, and it was worth it to be part of that journey. We got her to Manadokan and gave her all those instructions that you're familiar with, a parent gives a child in that moment where we're saying goodbye and could, knew what we were feeling and hoping it wouldn't be a difficult moment for Rebecca, these two teens, high school girls who were counselors, saw our need and came over to Rebecca and just with smiles and hugs welcomed her and, and told her in an excited way how much fun she was going to have and she was going to love it there. And she just turned and walked with them and she didn't even look back at us. We were basket cases. She was fine. But to me, this was the church stepping in, going for where we could go no further as a parent. You, oh, you, you so want to be there at their job site. You so want to be there at school with them. But we know we have our bounds. We have our, our boundaries. But here was the church picking up where we could not go any further. And I think of that. 
that important calling that God gives us to be enriching our community. That Dr. King's words call us to remind us this day the work that is before us. And it's God that we rely upon. It is God who provides us this abundance of grace to carry forth the work. It is God that has called the church into being. We didn't come up with this on our own. We didn't come up with this idea of, of how it was all going to work. This is God bringing us together as a wonderful community of faith, this wonderful, diverse community, that I pray that diversity will grow and grow, where we bring out the best in one another. We're, we're told that one day we will be made blameless. Wow, a lot of work's got to take place in this, in this heart, in this life, to be blameless. We can only be that, not because, again, of our merit, but because, as Paul tells us, God is faithful. Whatever you are facing, whatever difficulty awaits you this week and in this time, whatever threatens to divide us, we have the abundance of God's faithfulness to rely upon. And I believe we will see the fruit of our labors, and we will bless future generations to come. Dr. King did have a word to say in a sermon about finances, where we support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts. He said the following in a sermon. He said, I make no apologies for asking for financial support for the church. The church has a just claim on your active, practical, and financial support, if for no other reason than that your home is better, your community is better, your nation is better as a result of the existence of of the church. With all its faults, and it certainly has them, the church is man's strongest ally in his struggle to discover life at its best. Some of you will say that you support many charities and causes outside the church. I have nothing but highest of praise for these charities, which are doing so much to alleviate human suffering, Dr. King said. I support them strongly myself but which requires primary support and is most deserving of it, the church, which was the source of all charity and which will be the source of many more or the individual charities themselves. We, who are members of the church, are the lighthouse of the world. We are responsible for one task above all others, to keep the light of the gospel burning. All else must be secondary, and no amount of spending or righteous philanthropy can excuse us from the faithful fulfillment of that task. As Dr. King said then, words that are so relevant to where we're at as the church today. Let us be open to how God is seeking to lead us, to bring us into that fellowship. Worship service, fellowship, all made possible through the abundance of God's grace. And the good news is, God is not finished. As Paul was called to be an apostle, he told us that we are called to be saints. Now what Paul was dealing with in the church of Corinth was not folks who lacked confidence, who didn't think what they did was important. It was quite the opposite. What had gotten to Paul was there were some individuals who thought they were better than others. So putting saint in front of their name, what, what, what would that do? No. What Paul was calling them to be saints, what he was telling them was, a saint is someone who has Christ at the very center of their lives. God's word through Paul, Sothenes, and to the gospel writers, tells us that we are saints. Certainly not more important than others. And that, that's not something I run into. I don't, I, I don't see that as an issue. I see it more as thinking that our best days are behind us somehow. That God doesn't need the church anymore. Now the church of my grandchildren, when they are our age, are probably going to be very different than the church of today. But it's because of the abundance of God that will continue to enrich the body 
and the God who will sustain us in ministry means lives will be blessed and that we will have opportunity to shine that light. In his famous letter from the Birmingham jail, Dr. King said this, writing to the church pastors, many who are telling him to cool it, slow down, stirring the waters too much, said the following. He says, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. The time is always ripe to do right. The time in your life, what is it ripe for right now? What right work, right action, right behavior, right growth? Is God calling you to? Is God calling us together to? As the body of Christ. I give you these challenges as we go forth this week. God is supposed to be at the center of our lives. Is God at the center of your life? We reflect on Dr. King's teachings. This includes realizing that we are called to live not by our own wisdom, not by our own preferences and prejudices, but by the call of God. The vision of the kingdom that defines our hopes and prayers and service. We are in this together. We are part of something larger than ourselves. And lastly, what area or moment in your life or in the life of our church is right to do right? What opportunities are before us? May our hearts continue to be open to the one who has promised to guide us until that day when Christ returns. Let us open our hearts anew. Thanks be to God for the abundance of grace that is yours and mine to experience and to rely upon in facing whatever challenge we are facing. God's abundance is more than enough. Amen. praise for all that God continues to do in this world. We take this time for our morning offering. In each of your pews, you will find our sign-in book here. We just invite you to please sign this to those of you online. Please, if you haven't already entered your name in the chat, we are so honored and thankful that you are here. We invite you to fill this out as Betsy shares our morning offertory.
Let us pray. Good and generous God, we bring our gifts to you this day and pray that you might dedicate them to your work. We confess that we have too often missed being the church you wanted and needed. And we have placed the blame on not having enough money, time, members, talent, or power. We needed to be reminded by the Apostle Paul that we have all that we need, whatever our circumstances. Renew us, loving God, and give us a new day and another chance. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we go into our time of prayer this morning, I hope that we continue to pray for one another through the week as we seek to be the church that God calls us to be. An important part of our church community is our church staff, and I'm asking for your prayers for our staff. I'm sharing the following news with you. Donna Lyon, who has been our church administrator for, in August, it'll be 40 years, is stepping down from her position. And so we are giving thanks and praise for Donna. Donna, if you're part of this service today, we thank you, and we will have some time to express our thankfulness. Uh, Donna will be staying with it, on with us through September, and we'll, her and Danny will continue to be part of our church family here at Grace, but we are just so grateful for her ministry, the ministry of our church office. And also Debbie Henning, our music director, is also going to be stepping down. Debbie, we are so grateful for your ministry, the music ministry that you have, as we heard, enriched in the scripture today and enhanced. And we are just so grateful for your work and for Larry and for your family. You're, you are part of us as well, and you will always be family. But we know that Debbie is also giving us some time to adjust here as she will be concluding in June. So I do hope and ask your prayers for this time as our staff parish and which is the proper and proper stewards of our, of our church work with our staff to identify what is the best way to have a staff and addressing the ministries of the church that are before us. So they will be doing that and exploring deeply the duties of our staff and the best ways to fulfill them and those who will fill these positions in the years to come. So in the meantime, let us be keeping the Lion and Henning family in our prayers as we give thanks for the abundance of love that they have shown in their ministry amongst us. As I mentioned in sermon, we pray for all those who are going through difficult times in regards to the rains, to the flooding in California, to the awful effects from the tornadoes in the south. Uh, UMCOR is the first on the ground in these situations, so please be checking out UMCOR online where you can be helping with financial gifts. If you're unable to go online, if you want to send your checks here to the church, we'll be sure that these uh, are sent to UMCOR and we support their work along with our prayers. Please join me in a time of prayer. Lord, we are so grateful. Grateful that you have called each of us to be part of your church. This may be someone's first Sunday here joining us online or in person, to hear that we are loved, that we are called, that we are each included in your plan of salvation, of bringing wholeness to this world. Lord, we thank you for the joy we find in gathering in your name. We find joy in worshiping together and offering our praise and thanksgiving to you. Lord, we find joy in being able to serve you as we think about the ministries that we support and are part of globally and locally. Lord, we thank you for the needed fellowship that is ours to experience not only on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings with our youth, but in all the ways our, our groups connect throughout the week. We again think of Kaz and his work working with Dick and with all those who have so faithfully participated in the Sunday school classes over the years. Thank you for those who have given of themselves in so many ways that we can be in this space, that this space even exists. We know because of your grace working through others. So now we recognize it's our turn. Help us to continue the work of Dr. King in addressing injustice 
Show us, O oh God, where we need to be focusing our attention, where we need to be advocating, where we need to be speaking up, where we need to be a presence as the church. Lord, we thank you for how you feed us along the way, for the strength that we find in you. Lord, you enrich us at every turn, every ministry. We go to help someone, minister to someone, we end up being ministered to time and time again. Thank you for how you are ahead of us. There's not a conversation, there's not a situation we enter into that you haven't already been there. Thank you for paving the way. Thank you for those in in our lives who have paved the way in working towards justice and inclusion. Thank you for Kaz and for his teaching, for his continued work. He may have retired as a professor, but he kept and remained a good student of your word, allowing his gifts to be used by you. I thank you for the ways that Debbie and Donna have allowed you to use their gifts, their skills, to bring blessing, ministry, here in our church community. Thank you for the next chapters that you have in mind for them, Lord, continue to bless and be their source of strength. Lord, for all those who are in need, for those with upcoming medical procedure, for those who are battling illness, for those who are dealing with grief, loneliness, depression, Lord, whatever storm they are facing, may we as the church be able to remind them that they are not alone. May we never overstep, but may we always offer support and presence wherever we can. Lord, we are far from perfect, but you are perfect. You are faithful. You are the one who will sustain us to the very end. And in the end, when there is no more racism, when there is no more exclusion, when there is no more injustice, we have an eternity of joy to experience with you. Thank you for this promise. Thank you for the joy of this promise we are experiencing in this life as we walk with you and one another. Bless and enrich us in this time as we offer the prayer that you have given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we all join in singing hymn number 156, I Love to Tell the Story. Thank you. 
Please be seated. So I remind you of the challenges for this week. God is supposed to be at the center. Is God at the center of your life? Reflect on Dr. King's teachings. This includes realizing that we are called to live not by our own wisdom, not by your own preferences and prejudices, but by the call of God. The vision of the kingdom that defines our hopes and prayers and service. We are in this together. We are part of something larger than ourselves. What area or moment in your life or in our church is ripe to do right? May we all strive to fulfill God's vision, God's plan for the church. Let us go from here today secure in the knowledge that we are not lacking in any spiritual gift. We go into our world surrounded by the blessing of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the equipping of the Spirit to live and work as disciples who make disciples for the transformation of the world. Amen. Amen.